Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Pamela Pims, your host for today's Lunch and Learn here at the Hands-On Children's Museum in the heart of downtown Hendersonville. In conjunction with Blue Ridge Community College in Bee City, USA, we'll be talking to Matt Willey, art activist and founder of The Good of the Hive. He's painting a landmark mural on the wall right here outside at Hands-On Children's Museum. It gives me great pleasure, however, to introduce the people behind the scenes who've made all this happen. First, I'd like to introduce Kim Bailey. She's a tireless volunteer who's coordinated the Bee City USA program in Hendersonville ever since it began in 2015. Hi, Kim. Hi, welcome everyone. Five years ago, Hendersonville became the seventh city in the nation to be certified as a Bee City USA. And there are now over 200 certified B cities and B campuses across our nation. We are so fortunate in Hendersonville to have both a city and a college campus certified right here in our community. And we are especially grateful to Blue Ridge Community College today for helping us put on this lunch and learn. So what does it mean to be a bee city? Uh, we are working to raise awareness of pollinators and to plant habitat for pollinators. And this includes all pollinators, not only bees. In Hendersonville, our tree board takes the lead on planting projects, just like the demonstration pollinator gardens that will be put in right here alongside the bee mural in the future. Meanwhile, our environmental sustainability board works on education and outreach projects. All of these board members are volunteers, and just like honeybees, we never work alone. So we'd like to thank now all of our sponsors for this project. It's been five years in the making, and it just would not be possible without so many partners in our community. This project has been entirely funded by donations. As you can see, our sponsors are a diverse group representing garden centers and garden clubs, farms, food and beverage establishments, local nonprofits, and local businesses. Also beekeepers, apple growers, artists, educators, nature lovers, and even kindergartners. Some contributions have been financial, like the donation from the Community Foundation. Others have been in-kind, like the wall prep just completed by Burlett Painting. Henderson County beekeepers donated both money and honey in addition to all the sponsors listed here, we want to thank all those who took part in our pollinator friendly plant sale. We absolutely know the plants that you purchased help support pollinators. And we also expect they brought about much beauty, wonder and joy to you. Those after all are known to be side effects of pollinator gardening. And who couldn't use a little more good things like that, especially this year. As the Bee Mural is also now bringing beauty to our community, we hope you'll join us for events like the Love Hindo Shop Local Saturday taking place on Main Street and the mural site this coming Saturday, November 7th. You can watch the mural being painted and also shop for local honey, local artwork, baked goods, beverages, and more. Weather permitting, there'll even be a glass observation hive of live honeybees on display. We'd also like to invite you to stop by any time to see the mural coming to life in real life and also follow along online. Um, check out the videos and updates that we'll be posting on the Bee City USA Hendersonville page, um, that Facebook page. You can also follow the Good of the Hive on their multiple social media pages and you can find those listed all at thegoodofthehive.com. Thanks for joining us again for this Lunch and Learn. Thanks, Kim. Next, we have Carol Ann Leiden from Blue Ridge Community College. Blue Ridge has been designated a B campus since 2017, and they were only the second community college in the country to achieve this recognition. Carol Ann serves as the chair of Blue Ridge B campus and sustainability committee. Hi, Carol Ann. Hey, thank you, Pam. We're so excited to have all of you all joining us today and to have Matt and Pam here to bring us this awesome Lunch and Learn. We also are very grateful for our partners, 
the good of the hive, of course, Matt's organization, hands-on museum, and B City Hendersonville. So we've all worked together to bring this to you today, and we're so excited. Thank you for joining us. I know there's lots of Blue Ridge employees watching and some community members as well. So thank you, and I need to do a special thank you to Blue Ridge's Media Services Department and our social media coordinator who have done all the behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes work to bring this to you. So thank you to them. Um, I just, Blue Ridge is so proud to be a B campus and we really take that commitment very seriously. And if you haven't been to our campus in a while for the community members out there watching, come check out some of the neat things that we're doing. We have recently planted four acres of pollinator habitat on campus. Our students planted a Monarch way station that's certified and registered. And we've just got lots going on. So if you haven't been out in a while, come check out all the great things we're doing. And, um, the last thing I want to say is that we're hoping Matt will have some time for Q&A at the end. So as you're watching, if questions come up, put them in the chat box at the bottom and I'll be monitoring and um, hopefully we'll, we can get to a few of those at the end. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Carol Ann. Next, we have Joseph Knight, who's the executive director of the Hands-On Children's Museum. And the museum has done so much more than simply providing the wall as the canvas for the mural. Uh, their staff's played an integral role in mural fundraising efforts, educational events, and publicity. And Joseph, I know you're gonna tell us a lot more. Yes, <laughs> a hands-on children's museum is entering its 13th year of serving children throughout Henderson County in Western North Carolina. Our organization has reached over 400,000 people since opening um, over 13 years ago, and we're so excited to be a part of this amazing community project. At our children's museum, we are committed to inspiring the next generation of scientists. We want children to use their imagination so that they can embrace their natural sense of wonder. And the B mural project that we have is just a great initiative that's going to not only allow us to now to continue educating children about the importance of preserving the natural world while they embrace their unique connection to it, but also being able to have a resource that is accessible to everyone in our community. So the Children's Museum is happy to be open and we are located in the historic downtown Hendersonville. The museum is open this season, Tuesday through Saturday from nine o'clock a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And if you have not been to the museum lately, we have some really cool exhibits that are new for this season. And we have a couple of more that are going to go online within the next month or so. So for more information about the museum's exhibits and our programs, you can check us out on the web at handsonwnc.org. You can also follow us on our Facebook page as well. Again, we're so happy to be a part of this project and to have the exterior of our building be the canvas for the B mural. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. And before I introduce Matt, I think you'd like to watch this short video called The Good of the Hive Mural Portfolio. It was about 10 years ago and I was in my studio in Manhattan and I turned around and I saw this little tiny honeybee in the middle of the rug. And she was moving really slowly so I had this opportunity to get down on the floor and really study this little bee and hang out with her. And in that time, it took about two and a half hours before she died and I connected with her. I connected with the beauty of this little creature that I'd never noticed before. And that's really how this whole story began.
Now that you've seen what Matt Willie's all about, I've been fortunate enough to chat with him on almost a weekly basis through his podcast called The Good of the Hive. And you can find it on Spotify or iTunes or any of your favorite channels. It's, it's just so fun to follow him as he paints 50,000 bees all around the world. Hi, Matt. Hi, Pam. <laughs> Matt, I'm not even sure where to begin. So that I know we've just seen a wonderful video, but let's start with that wall outside. Okay. Tell me how it all began and, and what brought you here. Yeah, this mural on Hands-On Children's Museum in Hendersonville started a long time ago. Like it's actually had the biggest arc from the connection I had with Kim and others about like bringing the good of the hive to Hendersonville and then the amount of time to get to the point where we start painting, which is actually part of the cool part about this story. Um, but yeah, it started years ago. I was living in Asheville um, and I had just started the good of the hive. I hadn't been going that long and I ended up presenting with uh, Kim to the tree board to begin the process of the discussion. Does anybody want to bring the bees to Hendersonville? And that it just evolved from there. It was a pretty unanimous decision that that would be a great idea. But then there's the process of finding the wall. What's the best venue with the community? And um, and then how do we raise the funds to do it? And the process of like, even this year, it was supposed to be happening earlier in this year and then scheduling, there's my part in it. Like how do I was all over the planet trying to paint other places during a pandemic and then figuring out what was the right timing. So we finally got here almost four years later, but part of the, yeah. And part of the amazing thing, like I, didn't even really know when I started this project. When the Good of the Hive began, I was just a painter, an artist who wanted to raise some awareness about this, what I've heard was going on with the bees. And I had had this experience that I'll, I'll share with you later. But, the, but I really didn't know I was an art activist. I didn't know much about activating a communi community about anything, you know, other than doing a painting. And I had been painting murals for many years, but that was very contained to the project. So in terms of community outreach, this was a story that I felt needed to be heard around the world with the bees. So how do we do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I just started doing that with painting. There was a connection happening when I would paint bees on the wall. People would start sharing about stories about bees. And I always saw my job from the beginning of this project to talk about bees and to get bees in the front of people's minds through the art. Right, that was as deep as I went with it. But it was Kim, like as we were, we were finally getting to the part where I was gonna get here and paint on this wall. And Kim was like, Matt, it's amazing how many minds and hearts have been activated about the issue, about pollinators, about pollination, about food systems, about the community. And through just preparing to bring me to paint here. You know, and that was like a new realization for me in the process of, of being an art activist. You know, it goes way beyond just the art, letting the community come in and have events and things and festivals and auctions and all these things that came together to have it happen. I'm just honored and blown away by how amazing this community has been in, in getting there. I'm really struck by the fact that it's taken four years. Is, mm -hmm. is that a typical amount of time from the time someone approaches you to do a wall until it actually happens. What is what is typical? I mean, outside of this pandemic. Yeah, and I think there is no typical. Um, there's what's historically happened for me during the process has been some days it's like, does anybody have a wall? You know, like <laughs> I, anybody willing to pay a guy to paint bees on the wall? Like early on, that was all I was thinking because I'm like, I have to try and survive at this. I knew it wasn't a part time job. So then it it began, it depended on the project, how much had to go into it. Some of them are smaller. Some of them were able to jump in quickly. The average is about 18 months. Mm -hmm. That's I think been the average for each project. And there's been uh, 30 projects at this point, you know, um, and they all happen sort of organically. Like someone's heart opens up that they get it. They just get what I'm trying to do with the good of the hive. And that meets my desire and then we come together and begin to talk about it. So when you talk about what you want to do with the good of the hive, and we know mm -hmm. it's so much more than 
promoting the good health of bees and pollinators and all those things we need, but you have a mission and a vision. Yeah. Can you share that? Yeah, sure. The, and it's evolved over time, you know, where I started out with all of this was very different. It was just going to be one mural that I called the good of the hive. Actually, I'll tell this story later, but the, the actual mission uh, of the good of the hive is to create curiosity for the planet we live on through the lens of art, bees and storytelling. So rather than standing here and saying to you, think about bees, think about bees, think about bees, <laughs> I actually do something out on the wall that hopefully creates curiosity for people. So then they're going and looking it up online or getting involved in, in, in things in their community on their own, out of that, that. I think people are the most interesting when we're in a state of curiosity, you know, where it really brings out the best in people and the vision my vision has evolved over time and the and what I really see the potential being in the good of the hive is this vision where people, you know, see and experience the connectedness of all things, you know, because I, for me, the symbol of the bee to her hive, she's inextricably connected and operates that way, you know, um, and so I think leaning into that through the lens of the bee and looking at nature you know as an artist i was taught from early on in school to to look to nature for some answers in the studio you know and so we can look to answers in our own classroom or in our own just experience of being alive and that i think we're at our best when we're doing that so oh that's terrific yeah and you've mentioned that you'd like to see the people come together when they're looking at the wall mm -hmm. do you have any unusual experiences with that um, I think that all stems back. I mean, I might as well tell the story because that's really how that began is like I was in my studio in Manhattan in 2008 and this little honeybee flew in and landed right in the middle of the rug like I couldn't miss her. And so for whatever reason on that day, I just got curious and I got down on the floor and hung out with this little bee and I got my magnifying glass and I really sat there studying this bee going and connecting with her going wow they're so much cuter than i ever imagined <laughs> there was a fuzziness there was a puppy like element she was walking along the floor she only moved about two inches in two and a half hours mm -hmm. and so i really wasn't feeling vulnerable or afraid of the bee at all and so um after about two hours um she died and I put her out in the backyard and I came back in and I started researching honeybees online. And I immediately came across colony collapse disorder, which was a huge mystery back then. Millions of bees were dying all over the world and no one knew why. It was like an hour I was in the middle of Manhattan going, how is this huge thing, this devastating global event happening and no one's talking about it. I hadn't seen one magazine, I hadn't seen a newspaper article about it. And so I just started researching further and I came across a behavior of the honeybee called altruistic suicide or altruistic self-removal from the hive. And that is if a bee feels sick when it's in the hive, it will exit the hive and fly off into the abyss for the good of the hive. Wow. That's, yeah, that's where the name of the organization came from years later. And, um, and they do that because they're hardwired to understand that their immune system is collective. It's not based on the individual bee, it's based on the health of the hive. And this was you know, years before a pandemic would teach us this exact same thing, but I was sitting there going, whoa, so is ours. Like I just made this connection that my immune system being in Manhattan, I'm all suddenly in the subway going, I am so much more connected to all these people right? than I really thought. And, you know, so that just like really clicked with me at that point. And, you know, I was just a commissioned muralist at that point. I was painting all over the country. Someone would fly me somewhere to do a sports mural or to do a high-end interior in someone's home. I, I was just the hands of designers and things. I had no background in conservation or, or um, environment or activism, really. And so, it was about seven years and a friend of mine, I've been talking about how cool bees are to everybody and researching some behaviors just on my own. And um, a woman friend of mine sent me an iPhone video about seven years later of the side of a honey company in LaBelle, Florida. And 
Um, and she was like, you know, you should paint these on this wall. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'd been wanting to do one mural to raise some awareness. Didn't know where that would happen. But so I said, all right, I'm going to call them up. And I just called up this, this honey company in Florida and said, ask them. And they said, we would love a mural of these on our wall. We have no money to pay you. <laughs> the town has no money. And murals are illegal in the city of LaBelle. And so I was like, OK, we're not doing so good there. And uh, I just had a, I have a general thing that money guides too often. It's the, the, I believe money is useful and necessary, but I think it stops us from a lot of our best, like the best things about humanity at times, you know, if we're not paying attention. And so I just sort of almost flippantly said, don't worry about the money. I'll figure that part out. I, I'm getting too old to run from the cops. So if you can get the law changed, <laughs> I'll figure out a way to deal with the money. And then we had a nice conversation, hung up the phone, and I figured they would never call me back. And it was only about two months later, they called me up and said, OK, we got the law changed. When are you coming? And I had moved to Asheville at that point from New York in somewhere in the middle there. And um, and so I put up a little web page, you know, that just said, uh, I called it the good of the hive. And I asked some friends and clients. It wasn't even like a official crowdfunding or anything. but. And I got like $500 in gas money from some friends. And so I just hopped in my rusty old Ford Ranger and I went <laughs> totally on faith. Like, I wonder what's going to happen doing this. And these amazing things happened when I got there. Somebody put me up in their RV for 10 weeks. I had never even been in an RV. It was like <laughs> magical, like this little cave. I got to go in and read books when it was so hot outside or whatever. And then the restaurants in town started giving me free food and free salad bar and coffee shop wouldn't let me pay for a coffee they'd bring me breakfast on the job site and you know people started connecting around these this project like all i was doing was just painting bees and i was learning about bees too there was a live beehive on the you know right there so i would have bees landing on my paint brushes oh. and so i was getting to know them but the most important part of it was that i was seeing people show up and their curiosity and their interest in what was happening was mirroring what had happened to me. It was echoing what had happened to me on the floor, like with that little bee. And it, there was just something about it that people were sharing about their stories from when they were a kid and with their grandpa grandparents. And I tell this story all the time, like there was one that just has stuck with me all these years that I turned around and there was like an 80 something year old farmer in his overalls, like, just go with what you they, that looks like, you know, <laughs> and next to a maybe 16 to 18 year old girl with a nose ring and like just sleeveless tattoos going and they were just nodding. Oh, they were wow. looking the same direction and nodding and they did not know each other. That's and cool. that I just couldn't help but see there's something special going on here. So lots of other things happened as well on that project. But at one point they made the the mural site a water stop on a ride for hungry kids going across Florida, just one of those cycling rides. And on that day, one of the producers, Travis, about he was making a video for the ride, came up to me with a little honeybee perched on his shoulder, like a parrot. <laughs> and he was like a pirate or something. And he just said, This bee's telling me to come and talk to you. And I was like, Really? What's the bee saying? And we got into a conversation and he just asked me how many bees were in a healthy hive. And I had just learned it was between 30 and 60,000. And so I told him and he just said, do you think you could paint 50,000 of them? And it was like this second lightning bolt moment for me where I was, um, I was just like, I'm gonna see if I can do that. You know, no small and, feet. <laughs> yeah, and that was 5,500 bees ago and about 30 projects. I've painted wow. everywhere from Lyons, Nebraska, Florida, um, Southern California, and the middle of Manhattan with the World Council of Peoples at the United Nations. I've spoken at the UN. I've, um, I did a piece at Smithsonian, the National Zoo. And, um, and just it's unfolded in that way. I just did my first international piece right before this one at a an all girls school in High Wycombe, England. And, you know, it's just about connecting the whole world around one thing. You know, the bee is the only creature I know of that we keep, yet she remains wild. 
she's this beautiful bridge back to nature for humans and so you know there's just these elements to her rather than like she's not bound in race gender nationality political affiliation mm -hmm. none of it it's one thing on the planet that we can all look at that does mirror a lot of our behaviors and they do some things better but they live in that sense of community that we all crave you know and they do it so naturally and beautifully so it's that's really what the good of the hive is about you know i raise awareness about the importance of pollinators for sure because it is not just all about the honeybee but the honeybee is my symbol and metaphor for that illusion of separation we all live in we are connected whether we like it or not and i think we're going to achieve much better things in the world when we remember that absolutely you know? It's yeah. beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. What momentum. What momentum you've had. I mean, I wish <laughs> I'm kind I wish, of tenacious. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we had the time to go into. And then how did the second mural and the third mural? I mean, it must have just unfolded. In well, the... I can listen to the podcast. Oh, right. That... <laughs> I love the podcast, especially the one from the UK. They're the last two. Right. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, um, but we have a couple of questions already that came in from the audience. Oh, I don't sure. know if more is coming as we as we speak. Feel free to you've got some okay because I've got some here too. Let's see what's happening. Oh thank you. Okay. One of our English faculty wants to know if you know of any good sources for students researching pollinator pollinator recovery efforts. Oh um, well like an English teacher, I was thinking Britain all of a sudden when you were saying one of our English. Um, so I think the best way is like, I am an art activist. So I often defer to things like Bee City USA. So go on the Bee City USA website. They're, that is like their gold with that. They're very up to date. They know exactly what's happening. Um, Pollinator Partnership is another one. They're a great organization that has a lot of information. Um, yeah. Those yeah, are that the two leads to I would the, go straight to. I was gonna say at least the second question, which is how is the good of the hive connected to B City and B campus initiatives? Is it a formal partnership? Um, it isn't a formal partnership. It's kind of a magical one. Because <laughs> when I first started this the good of the hive back in 2015, I had no idea whether anybody was going to want a mural of bees on their wall. Like my dad, we had this funny argument in the car one time. He's like, you're an artist, you're surviving on your art, and now you're going to go paint bees? What is that? You know, like, I was like, I don't know, I just feel like I've got to do this. So I just give it a try. And, you know, I, one of the parts of the, that original year was that I tried to run a Kickstarter campaign. And I got to a certain amount on that Kickstarter campaign after all this work, making the video, everything, and it just wouldn't go any higher than that. So I got none of the money from that and mm. spent about, you know, a bunch of thousands to get it there. And so I was like, okay, now I'm going backwards in terms of <laughs> surviving at this. But what had happened was I found out that I, when I moved to Asheville, I had moved within one mile of Phyllis Stiles, who is the founder of City USA. And so I had, you know, at one point called her up and just met with her and hung out with her for a bit. And when that Kickstarter was going, she just pulsed out to all the B cities. I think there was only like 19 at the time. Um, and even though monetarily my Kickstarter didn't work out, it actually was the catalyst mm. because other places like Carborough was the first town. It wasn't the next mural I would do, but it was the first town that jumped on like, okay, we got seven places for you to paint, like come here and talk to us about this. So it was this, that, and I, you know, we try and support each other's work as much as possible. I'm constantly telling people about that organization and, um, and the, the amazing work they do, you know, it was integral in this, this project here, B City um hendersonville that chapter was a big part of of bringing me here so mm -hmm. yeah i know one of the questions and i think you've answered it was how many murals so far and how many bees mm -hmm. so want to repeat that yeah so i'm I, I go by projects now not murals because there have been a lot that um i might like i just did one this summer during the pandemic at woodstock the woodstock monument uh in bethel woods 
um, in upstate New York. Ooh. Now I did a lot of laser engraved bees into this peace symbol, but I hand painted this sort of, you know, flower child queen and put her in the center. So I really am only counting, you know, I'm counting that as bees because it's a contained project. So I have to do an official count this winter. I'm dancing around it because I'm around 30 projects and um, up over 5,500 bees. I think higher than that, but I, I err on the side of safety in that, um, yeah. I'm going to add to this question. The question is, what can people expect to see on the completed Hendersonville mural? But I want to know even more. I want to know when you're looking at a wall or you're choosing the site, mm -hmm. do you just, do you see it that way? I mean, can you see it before it happens or how does it come to you what you're going to paint or do yeah. you even know? Yeah, it's very different. Like that's where if there's one piece of this process that I get to have for me as an artist, um, specifically it's that because i feel a responsibility in that way as an artist to keep this as pure as possible so i am part of the idea is not to go and plaster a mural that won't fit in that place so i go in and say okay what is the the landscape right now like bees going out into the landscape like what is here you know, and how does it serve? Is it going to serve to have a more abstract story or is like a little more drama going to serve here? Like the piece on the great ape house at the Smithsonian was they didn't, I didn't think they, they were going to want me to paint on the great ape house, but it was one of the five places they said, take your pick, but they were totally steering me down toward the, the farm and the <laughs> barn and where they had this bee playground. And I was like, just not feeling it down here. And then I got to the great Ape house, which is B in Italian, you That's know, amazing. like I was yeah, like, Ape. this is where they go. And we went really dramatic because the story for me in that place was the reputation of a bee swarm, as opposed to like the reputation of a King Kong. We're like, you know, demonizing these creatures when they're actually just these gentle, beautiful things. So mm -hmm. how do we bring people into focus with that? And so each one, sometimes I'll, I've had times where I've woken up in the middle of the night, sat straight up and drawn a design. And I'm like, okay, that's gonna end up somewhere. Two years later, it ends up on a school somewhere. And then other times I do walk up and I have no idea what I'm gonna paint. <laughs> I don't wanna scare anybody, but there is sometimes like just that trust because everything I'm doing as an activist and an artist is mirroring whatever we need in the world. Like we're always trying to figure everything out and nail it down and like lock it into these things. And A, we're not at our best when we do that. And B, it's no pun intended, B, it shuts out possibility left and right. Mm. So if we can just stand there and be in the, and hover in the uncertainty, I often say, like how long can we hover there? because that's where we are with so many things right now. So the bee symbolizes that so beautifully and the work is just carrying the message of the bees. That's my job, you know? And, um, and this one in particular, I was like, we have a huge butterfly fan in the audience here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's like pretty much, hand over there. yeah, there's pretty much Love no him. way I was going to put a, uh, not put some butterflies on this mural. And I really am leaning more into all pollinators. The hive and the bee are my symbol for us. Like I'm not painting bees, that hive and that bees, if you come by and look at that mural, to me, I'm painting us. It's not, and when people really understand that the queen isn't the boss, she's an energy and a balancer. You know, she's reading what the collective needs and then she's operating in that, that instance, it's sort of, apropos for leadership. What is a good leader? They're not just telling everybody what to do. They're listening. They're saying what is like around us that's changing that we need to shift for. That's what a queen does in the hive, you know? So like, those are the kinds of things that I'm, I feel I'm really painting. Um, and the rest is like, you know, I'm unfolding more and more the, the pollinators and eventually I want the good at the hive to be about trees, water systems. I have like a really incredible idea for a dirt mural, you mm. know, like all of these things because it's all connected. But I just for now, the pinpoint of that is the bee to her hive.
So when the queen decides it's time to exit the hive and explain this a little bit, there's a swarm, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a question, should I be afraid of the swarm? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, it's they're at their most docile when that happens. There's, there's a couple of times, um, there's only a couple of reasons bees will exit a hive. One, if there's say a forest fire, that's why when um, they calm down, when they're you know smoked, because they'll put they'll start eating and filling their stomach with honey, oh. preparing to leave. If there, this is the way I understand it anyway. If there is danger, and they need to leave. But they also, when a bee swarms and the queen decides it's time, we're gonna like hand this over to another queen. She'll lay three queen eggs and then leave to go do another the another hive. Um, really, it's just like a giant smoke screen. The, the bees, as I understand it, they are um, surrounding her. She'll be in the center of all those bees that are swarming, um, basically. So if birds come along and are picking off bees, they're not getting the queen because she's their source of building a new one. She's the generator for another one. She'd really, a swarm and a mating flight are the only reasons she would leave the hive, really. Oh. Um, but they filled their stomachs with honey. So they're like, they're pretty docile in that in that state of swarm, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I'm also not a beekeeper. So like a lot of people think I learned a ton and I do know a ton, but beekeeping questions, I'm not your guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about this one? Here's a question. Are you getting the national focus you planned on? Um, I'm getting probably more. You know, um, so you're getting international focused. Yeah, we're gonna. I think we're gonna be on the cover of. We definitely have an article coming out in the British Beekeepers Association <laughs> magazine this month. So exciting! And um, but they, uh, you know, I was on the Today Show this summer. That was like a thrill. I just did my first TEDx, which will be coming out in. Um, within a month, I think. And that TEDx was on change? Yeah, it was seven people, um, a rocket scientist, a music exec, um, a puppeteer, and um, a minister in the South. We were all talking about uh, change. Can you give us like just a couple of minutes, maybe more, <laughs> of, of that talk? I mean, or can, can you talk about it at the TEDx talk and I mean, what you wanted? It's really it, a lot of that talk for me was about um, what happened for me in terms of changing in order that um, you've got to look over there and in, in order that um, that I was open enough to accept whatever that bee was bringing me when I met her in the studio. So it's kind of that part of the story. Uh, it was about how I found, like I, I always say this, and this is in the talk, but there's there's two things that the bee symbolizes that every human craves, and I was no exception, right? Like the there is the, um, the hive, the connectedness to all things, and then the sense of purpose about our existence. You know, I think that's the sense of purpose is something that I see a lot of young people just overwhelmed with everything that's going on in the world and they're they're not having that as naturally mm. you know like it's it i get so many young people asking me about like because i i do have the sense of purpose of a bee like this came to me and you know um i was getting not i mean tired of painting what i was painting i was tired of just making things pretty which was mm -hmm. my job or you know it was i was the hands of other people's design and this this idea, you know, this connection to the bee and the environment came in and I had this like sense of purpose. They needed me, you know, like, mm -hmm. and not, and it just unfolded that way. It was years in that process, but even just getting to think about it, that weaving my art into this sense of purpose was huge for me in, in changing and then hopefully being prepared enough to launch the good of the hive, even though it was terrifying. You know, like how do you at 46 just drop everything and go do another career? Like the other one was working, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it wasn't happening. So yeah. Yeah. Well, but which is also a question, and that is, have you always been a painter? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it never, this is another joke, but I, I 
never had a plan B. An artist, I should yeah, say. Yeah, I've always an been an artist. It never occurred to me to be something else. Um, and everything. And I had two wise women in my world that when I was young, um, that steered me in that way. I had an aunt who was a designer, toy designer at Hasbro, and my mom is an artist. Oh. So those two figures were like something in there. The two of them showed me that this was possible, you know, and then there was the part of me that just like, I'm going to just go do this and, you know, and figured out a way. Well, here comes a question I'm sure you've heard before. Do you have a favorite mural of all that you've done? If so, where is it and why is it your favorite? I don't like the word favorite. <laughs> I really don't. I have things and stories, as you know, because I tell them to you all the time, <laughs> um, of like magical things that happen on projects. Um, and there's always like two ways to look at that, right? Like there's there was something extremely challenging and amazing and adventurous for me about painting at Smithsonian. Like that was quarter of a million people came by while I was painting. The energy coming out, going in those doors of the Great Ape House every day, like as I was painting was just overwhelming. And I can't even begin to describe that to somebody. Um, and it was also 14 weeks of painting. We went through extreme heat to snow to like having to overwinter and then come in the spring and finish again. And like that kind of experience. And I still get more emails about like, or responses on Instagram or whatever about that mural because so many people see it and it's so big. Um, How big? It's 351 bees, but, um, but the bees are like this big. So it's, it's just massive when you turn a corner, it's a giant swarm of bees on the building. And, but there's also these other amazing experiences that I had where uh, I was telling someone this yesterday, I don't even know where, but like on the Janney Elementary mural, which was literally spearheaded by a seven-year-old girl. Mm. And I was like, I'm going, I'm gonna do it. She said she wanted to be a bee scientist and a dancer when she grew up. And I was like, well, let's do this. And so we ended up doing that mural, which was unbe an unbelievable experience because I don't have come with a, a huge amount of experience with kids, but I was around a lot of that energy. There were 700 kids watching that mural happen all day long between like, there was, it was constant because it was out by their, their, where they had lunch, where they played, where they before school and after school stuff was. And there was a moment where this one girl is, I was overwhelmed on that project. I was like, I don't even know if I can paint this thing. I'm gonna have to get the principal to like quarantine this office, getting hit with kickballs. I'm like, there's <laughs> screaming at me. It was just like, anybody who hasn't been around kid energy a lot, <laughs> you kind of got to get used to it. And here I am, my perfectionist self, trying to do this mural with my tiny little brushes. And I couldn't get all the sound out. And there's one point where I just stood back like, she doesn't know it. There's a six, seven year old girl talking my ear off and I have no idea what she's even saying, but I can tell she's saying bees, 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 queen bee, queen bees, bees, bees. <laughs> and I'm just standing there like overwhelmed and almost scared that I'm not gonna be able to achieve this mural. And I was faced with a decision. I was like, why am I doing this work? Is it for my own ego to like do this incredible thing that I'm someday gonna be like wherever, like what, and that's where artists start. We all start there. We're trying to be the most incredible us that we can be. But that little girl, I had a choice. I either had to push her out of the way and be like, <laughs> go eat some lunch girl or look at her and say, okay, let's, let's get her, keep her as excited about bees as she is right now. And I just chose in that moment that for the rest of this or th this project, I was going to lean into that. Well, that that also leads to a question because I know that you get a lot of requests now, you know, especially now yeah. to come paint murals. What makes you decide to choose to do it? Is there something in particular? Is is there a story around what makes you decide to go where? That's a part of my a part of my process. Like I go on intuition, and sometimes. Um, because I am, I am curating this to some degree at this point, because I, there's no physical way I could paint everything that ever, everybody wants me to paint, just not too many. So when uh, I'm looking at how do we spread this out around the world, but not just geographic locations, but the type of place, 
Mm. I'm hoping to go to every type of place and to every demographic and everything and community around the world because when it's done, I want to have connected us all. So I have to somehow represent through the art and the location and the, the projects a, a really good cross section of that. Mm. And that is evolving, as we yeah. know. So, like, I'm that's really, I, I go on intuition and also, can they help this happen? Because there has, they have to meet me. This is a partnership when it happens. And so, I can't just, at this point, I'm not big enough to just say, oh, you don't have any resources or any real engagement. We'll just come and paint there. That would be the wrong energy. Like it's about being invited and then we meet and come up with it ourselves, you know, together. Well, we're, we're, we're very delighted that the energy has occurred with <laughs> hands-on children's music. Yeah, me here. too. And, you know, big thanks to that. Um, all right. It looks like, do we have, I have another question here. Do we have any others after this? Okay. Um, so this one is, mm -hmm. other than raising bees in a hive, how can we as residents help sustain their growth and surrounding habitat. Sure, I always recommend taking whatever space you have, you know, whether it's a window box or whether it's a piece of your yard and dedicating it to inviting pollinators in and make it a, an adventure and a journey. Don't just like do it because you gotta do it. Like really see what you can, what you can do in that arena. Like talk to the Bee City USA people, they talk to Pollinator Partnership, they know what native species are great to put in in a particular habitat and they'll know which which pollinators are struggling that might need a little more help and then you can get excited if you're like that pollinator is really struggling and i just attracted a few to my yard and took care of them like that's kind of amazing you know well i remember what you said to me the other day i said i've got a wasp nest right outside my front door what do i do about this and you said oh watch it <laughs> You know, they're there for a reason. They're going to tell you something. And, you know, this thing's been up there for at least a month and I have been fascinated and I'm not afraid of them. And I come in every day and I leave, you know, I know they know me and I say hello to them. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, and even the other day, I, I think I was sitting somewhere and a wasp landed on me. And normally I would be terrified. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, it was like, oh, hello. I really don't want you there. <laughs> But, you know, it was all yeah. good. You make me think about these things. And, and I think you probably make others think too. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the element of, um, you know, a friend of mine always says a miracle is just a shift in perception, you know? So like, how are we, we have these preconceived ideas of so many things and this, the bees and the pollinators. Like, I always think there's this whole world going on out there. If I just give one bit of my energy to that during the day, I might start to see the rest of my world differently, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just being open to that perception change, you know? And it took me a long time before I would let a honeybee even walk along my finger, because I was still like, oh, okay, I know what you are, but I'm not sure. But that's, that's human. Mm -hmm. that's building relationship it's not we shouldn't just dive into a relationship look where that gets us sometimes you really <laughs> want to date for a while and then get to know them before you know you marry them before you let them walk on yeah you know, really exactly <laughs> so you know that's really yeah. just what it's about okay well i see where it almost we've got about what 10 minutes left do you all have anything else you want to add or say or anything before we go to this last video we're good Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very, very much. And stay tuned. There's there's one more video and it is the good of the hive. It's about change. And in the meantime, don't forget to go to the Bee City USA Hendersonville website on Facebook. Go to the good of the hive. Watch Matt on Instagram, Facebook. And listen to our podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bees in a hive are like cells of one body, and they never forget this. People are connected to each other in the same way, but for some reason we forget this truth. No matter how difficult the challenge in my life, 
When I look back after, the pain was never really about the situation itself. It was about whether I felt alone or not in the process of going through it. I think it's important to remember right now that we have never really been alone. We have so many things to fix that have been wrong for a very long time, but we were never separate from each other through any of it. The separation is an illusion. It's a profound forgetting of the fact that we are all connected and always have been, just like the bees.